Max Payne was a huge success on the PlayStation 2, so it didn't take long for various ports to pop up. It eventually found its way to the Game Boy Advance and went on to become one of the most technically impressive games on the system. This is, in essence, the original Max Payne reimagined as an isometric shooter. The player must blast their way through rooms and corridors filled with enemies using a sizable arsenal, ranging from a Desert Eagle to a shotgun and from an Uzi to a pile of grenades. Of course, these aren't the only ways in which to overcome the enemy. Bullet Time makes a return as well, which serves as your main defense. With a simple tap of the R button, Max will die in the direction that he's moving in, with time slowing down, allowing him to dodge bullets, and also giving you an advantage to your aim. Now visually, Max Payne on the Game Boy Advance is nothing short of stunning. The characters in the game appear to be polygonal, and they're set against a decently detailed pre-rendered background for each stage. The game engine and its capability to utilize 3D characters is what makes bullet time work. The effect is well implemented, since Max and his enemies are real-time 3D objects, which gave the developers a lot more freedom when it came to their animations. They dart around the screen in a smooth and fluid fashion, with their arms and legs flailing about once they hit the ground. These animations are only enhanced further when bullet time kicks in, revealing all of the intricate details packed into the game. But this isn't just limited to character animation. The game also allows for destructible and interactive objects that you'll find throughout the adventure, such as crates and bottles, but also holes left behind from your bullets on walls. Seeing all of these animations play out in slow motion and never missing a beat helps cement Max Payne as one of the best looking games on the handheld. When I first heard of Tekken on the Game Boy Advance, I thought it was a joke. I mean, how could they possibly bring one of the most successful 3D fighters to the much inferior hardware? Well, I was completely wrong, as it delivered a respectable take on the popular fighter, even if some corners were cut. With the game closely following Tekken 3 more than any other entry, Tekken Advance follows most of its characters and fighting mechanics, with its roster including the likes of Yoshimitsu, Nina, Paul, and of course, Tekken 3 favorite Jin Kazama. Each of the characters in the game retain most of their moves, which are mainly performed by the A and B buttons, which are used for punching and of course kicking. But if they're used with other buttons, such as the shoulders or directions, your character can perform a combo or a much stronger move. By implementing this setup, the GBA version managed to translate nearly all of the moves from the home console version, but in practice, it does require a lot of patience in order to get right. When it comes to visuals, Tekken on the Game Boy Advance looks incredible. The polygonal aesthetic of the Tekken series is, for the most part, intact, but as I mentioned earlier, this is where a lot of corners were cut. As you would expect, the game uses pre-rendered character models rather than trying to render them with polygons, and as a result the game's animation feels a bit choppy, which in turn changes the game's timing during gameplay that might stump some longer time fans of the series. Still, it looks good for a portable game. Each arena's floor rotates around in a Super Nintendo Mode 7 fashion that was re-popularized by the GBA, with each back receiving a relatively nice level of detail, giving each stage a unique look and feel. On the whole, Tekken is a solid fighting game that proved that the GBA was more than capable, providing games usually tethered to the home console, allowing them to thrive and flourish in the handheld environment. The Game Boy Advance was home to a surprisingly good amount of first-person shooters, not something you'd expect considering the limitations of the hardware, but time and time again, developers would prove that the handheld was more than capable of producing something you'd only normally see on a home console at the time. Now, 007 Nightfire is the perfect example of this, and sees you taking up the fight as James Bond as you set out to crush yet another world-ending plot. The game is split up into a series of levels that naturally increase in difficulty the further you progress, and to counteract this, the player is able to utilize a whole range of deadly weaponry and nifty gadgets to get the job done. You've got your standard pistols, to the more deadly machine guns and rifles, as well as non-lethal options like the keychain, which can incapacitate an enemy in a flash. Graphically, Nightfire on the Game Boy Advance is one of the most ambitious first-person shooters created on the handheld. The team behind it developed a true three the engine for Nightfire instead of implementing the widely popular ray casting technique, which meant that instead of essentially faking a first person engine like how Duke Nukem Advance or Doom operated, Nightfire features texture mapped polygons for the environment and key objects like vehicles and furniture. The characters and non specific objects are represented by sprites, but they don't seem out of place on the small screen. Thanks to this approach, the level design also benefited, as the developers had a lot more freedom in level layout, allowing for a more natural 
whole field reach a level, but on the other hand, it did have a huge effect on performance. And while fully playable, it's not exactly what you'd call ideal. But seeing all of the little touches the developers were able to pull off is easy to appreciate. Overall, it may not be the best FPS on the handheld, but when it comes to sheer technical achievement, 007 Nightfire is something worth commending. Summon Knight's Swordcraft Story 2 is very similar to the first entry, and it's almost more of a reimagining rather than a sequel. Don't get me wrong, there is a new quest, all new characters, new summons and all new areas to explore, but the core gameplay is very reminiscent of the first game. It sees you exploring dungeons and various areas from a top-down perspective, and once you run into an enemy encounter, the game pulls away to a side-scrolling view, where you have free control over your character. During each battle, you can switch between three weapons that you have equipped, and summon something known as a guardian beast to cast spells. Now the one part of Summon Light 2 that differs from its predecessor is the crafting system. Atlas chose to simplify the crafting a bit, and instead of having a weapon blueprint that requires a certain amount of different materials, you now only need one base material. Once you have crafted the basic weapon, you can then upgrade it accordingly, and the higher your craft ranking, the more upgrades you can add to any given weapon, and this is where most of the fun lies in the game, ever pursuing the most advantageous weapons. Summon Light 2 has some of the best looking visuals you'll ever see on the handheld. It goes without saying the side-scrolling battles look amazing, but Atlas really touched up the exploration segments of the game as well. Gone were the days where you had to explore the same dungeon over and over. The variety of areas was truly a great improvement over the original game, and did a good job of keeping things more interesting when compared to the rather repetitive multi-floor dungeon found in the first outing. Summon Light 2 ramped up the visual scale, but it maintained the smooth animation and exciting battles everyone who played the original will know and love. It's without a doubt one of the best looking games on the Game Boy Advance, so if you never got around to playing it, it's well worth giving a shot. Advanced Guardian Heroes is a sequel to the classic Sega Saturn game. It manages to retain many of the features that made the original so memorable, with the first being the engaging and at times hectic side-scrolling gameplay that sees the player traversing a huge variety of levels that each have their own obstacles and enemies to overcome. One of the best aspects of the first game was how your characters earned experience points by taking on enemies, which could then be spent to upgrade various stats like attack, defense, magic, and so on. Advanced Guardian Heroes also lets players upgrade their character's skills, but instead of earning experience for every attack, enemies leave behind crystals that can be spent at the end of each level to buy upgrades. This offers the perfect way for the player to tailor each character to their specific style of play, opening up many different strategies that could potentially win the day. Graphically, the anime style character sprites and colourful backgrounds provide quite the contrast. The majority of levels in the original Guardian Heroes were set in the countrysides or in villages, while the settings in the sequel have players wandering through burnt out cities, speeding down highways and even finding your way into space. Most levels make use of some of the Game Boy Advance's better graphical tricks, such as multi-layered background scrolling, transparencies and pseudo 3D effects. Because of this, the game is quite the looker, but as a result it does have a tendency to falter, with the frame rate taking a dip when the action starts to heat up. Thankfully it's nothing that destroys the gameplay experience, rather just something that you'll find yourself getting used to as you play through each level. On the whole, Advanced Guardian Heroes isn't quite as satisfying as a sequel to one of the Saturn's great greatest game should be, but it is a decent beat-em-up that should please those who go into it knowing exactly what to expect. When Mega Man X came out, it featured a character that would stand out amongst any in the Mega Man franchise in terms of popularity. He would eventually star in his own game on the Game Boy Advance, which brought all of the best elements of the previous titles. It saw you jumping, running, slashing and shooting your way through stages until you reach and take out the boss. The core gameplay remained unchanged, but several new additions managed to mix it up a bit. For one, Zero doesn't have Mega Man's copy ability. You'll instead gain new weapons throughout the game, and these weapons don't necessarily add any weakness for the enemy, but because of their different ways of working, they all have their uses. You're also able to assign different elemental effects to your weapons, either lightning, fire or ice, and these do add weaknesses to the enemy, allowing you to combine different weapon techniques along with different elemental types, giving you a variety of options and strategies during battle. The other big inclusion was the way the game was structured. Unlike past Mega Man games, you couldn't just pick which boss you wanted to fight, instead you would choose 
choose one of a few missions that are on offer at any given time, and as a result you weren't forced to go down that linear path. Adding to the overall enjoyment of the game is you could essentially carve out your own way. Now the Mega Man series has always been known for its beautiful 2D visuals, and this game is the perfect reminder of why. Zero is massively detailed and fluidly animated, with each and every one of its moves being hand-drawn to near perfection. The game's levels and enemies are also very detailed, especially the huge boss characters which can sometimes take up half of the screen and have multiple death animations depending on the weapon you use to defeat them. In a day and age where the constant pursuit of visual fidelity has all but consumed the mainstream audience, Mega Man Zero shows that drawing every detail by hand still pays off practice that thankfully still persists to this day. Simply put, this is one of the best looking Game Boy Advance games out there, which is now easily accessible on modern consoles, so if you never had the chance to play it when it first released, it's now easier than ever to try it out for yourself. Riviera stands as one of the greatest RPGs on the GBA. Its seamless blend of narrative and gameplay cemented it as one of the must-have titles on the handheld. At its core, it was a very traditional take on the genre, with turn-based menu-driven battles, as well as a whole range of environments to explore. It saw you taken up the role of a young man known as Ian, who must destroy an ancient evil that was sealed away in order to save the world. On the surface, it sounds like just another cliché tale, but this is where each and every character you'll meet along the journey comes into play. Their distinct personalities add so much to the events that transpire, and succeed in creating a believable, but more importantly intriguing world. Graphically, I can honestly say that this is one of the most impressive Game Boy Advance games I've ever played. The backgrounds are all detailed and hand-drawn, with the only downside being that many of them are reused, making the environment a bit repetitive after a while. But each character has a range of hand-drawn facial portraits for each of their expressions during their dialogue, giving them, like I mentioned earlier, a level of personality no other RPG on the system could match. The character and monster designs are all certainly inspired and presented in a very consistent consistent style. The attention to detail in the game is outstanding, far beyond what most RPGs on the handheld offer. Even enemy sprites have several animations of their own for each of their attacks as well, with the only downside of the enemy artwork and sprites being that it suffers from frequent palette swapping, so most of the enemies you encounter after a while just become different coloured versions of the same targets you've taken up many times before. However, this was standard fare in RPGs as it had been in the past, and is therefore forgivable, especially taking into consideration the level of detail and personality put into designing each of the types of monsters you encounter. Overall, if you're on the lookout for your next RPG to get stuck into, make sure it's Riviera. If you know Doom, then you'll know exactly what to expect from the Game Boy Advance port. Of course, the main draw is shooting the hell out of everything on the screen, and I can't tell you how fun it is to blow the crap out of random demons using all of the cool guns you'll eventually acquire in the game. This is definitely a high point, as it is for most first-person shooters, but what sets this game apart is just how simple it is to get into. Most shooters nowadays use a lot of buttons, have lots of actions, different this, different that, almost drowning new players in assorted buttons and commands. Not so with Doom, this game is truly the forefather of first person shooters. The simple controls and no free look make this game extremely easy to get into, making it perfect for on the go play. Now when looking at the game graphically, it may be extremely crude when compared to what's on offer by first person shooters today, but within the limits of the handheld hardware, it still managed to push the full fledged Doom experience, including all of its elaborate level design. It goes indoors and outdoors, up and down elevator shafts over ledges and through secret passages, creating an endless way to approach each level. The game even deploys lighting effects to create a specific mood. Areas will darken in places, and some levels will have flashing illumination to simulate busted overhead lights. Even more impressive, the engine features textures that adorn all of the ceilings, floors and walls, with the only thing being scaled back graphically from the original being the actual screen resolution the game is running at. Characters and textures tend to get blurry off into the distance due to this reduced resolution, but it's nothing that affects the overall gameplay in a negative way. Doom on the Game Boy Advance really set the standard for all of the first person shooters that would follow it on the handheld, so if you're on the lookout for an FPS to play on the GBA, then Doom should be your first port of call. Gekido Advance tells the story of a ninja who must investigate mysterious happenings in a small town. It's essentially a beat-em-up, but there is actually a point beyond bashing heads, 
that makes it more than just mindless fighter. The problem with beat em ups is that they are basically a 20 second game dragged out across an hour or two. You move a character left to right whilst taking out an assortment of enemies, but instead Gekudo plays out more like the classic River City Ransom, with its interconnecting buildings, rooms, streets and pathways that add a huge amount of variety to the adventure. Keys must be found for doors, lanterns must be found to go underground, the player must converse with NPCs to find clues on where to go. The game couldn't be described as an RPG, but it does certainly borrow certain elements, which all come together to create one of the best beat-em-ups on the handheld. Now Naps Team and the development studio responsible for Gekido Advance, and this was the third title in the series. Previous installments appeared on the original Game Boy and PlayStation 1. With the PlayStation 1 version, they tried to bring the beat-em-up into the 3D realm, which worked fairly well for many people, but they wisely chose to keep Gekido Advance purely in the 2D dimension. Their artistic skills put most other developers to shame, with rich hues, environments drawn in lush reds, greens and blues, these are among the finest visuals you'll find on Nintendo's handheld. More impressive are the characters, which are large and wonderfully animated. The visual style is more than a little similar to SNK's fighting games. Add in many animated cutscenes, and what you have is a truly astonishing game that manages to still look just as good today as it did back then. Overall, Gekido is a solid beat-em-up, and a real showcase of the Game Boy Advance's ability, with its clever design making sure the game never became stale. So if you're fond of the genre, this one is definitely worth checking out. I've always been a huge fan of Zelda, and the Game Boy Advance release The Minish Cap went on to become one of my favourite entries. Throughout the game, Link will acquire a huge amount of weapons and items to use. Link's sword is a basic frontal attack, but can be upgraded by a local swordmaster and by progressing through the main quest. Though the series has always had many different weapons in them, the developers were still able to create some clever and unique weapons to use. From the basic shield to the digging moment, each item is well thought out and essential to trudging through the dungeons and completing the challenging puzzles. Now when I fired the game up, the first thing that hit me were the graphics. They are just so good for the Game Boy Advance. Whilst not entirely realistic, they are both charming and vibrant, and the character sprites are very well designed and animated, and it really gives personality to them past the dialogue, which a lot of GBA games fail to do. The environments and the characters are very colourful and fantastically rendered. That simply puts all other Game Boy Advance games to shame, and you can tell the developers were meticulous and getting it just right, and as a result the graphics really shine. You could complain that it steals the stylings from the Four Swords minigame included with a link to the past on the Game Boy Advance, but that doesn't bother me because it still looks great. The Minish Cap proved that you don't need the 3D world to be a Zelda game. 2D Zelda was more than a life, and Minish Cap more than proved it. It was a truly epic quest, combining simple and accessible clever puzzles. The game stayed true to its name and roots by keeping all of the good tropes of the series intact. This is one Game Boy Advance game that cannot be missed. Well that does it for today's video, keep an eye out for part 3 as that will be coming up soon, so don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell to get notified about new videos. You can follow me on all of the socials which are linked below to stay up to date, and also join my growing community on Discord to meet many like-minded gamers to continue the conversation with. I'd like to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters, Rhino, Skilljim, Shuden, Richard, Amy, Daniel, Paul, Dio, Omar, Strider, Pierre, Carl, Awesome Jacket Dude, GameCube Galaxy, and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining my Discord or supporting the channel through Patreon, you'll find all of these links down below. As always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video. I'll catch you next time.